All right, first thing I want to talk about today, uh, let's take a look over the web page. We'll have a quiz due tonight. So if you go down to this week's announcement, uh, where did it go? That's right here. And you have, I think, the three problems. I, wait. Yeah, the three problems. They're all about. Um, There's uh, only two. Two. Yeah, yeah, right. It's two. Sorry. There are two. It's just. Uh, uh, there are three response questions, and uh, it's about the uh, first one is like a type two improper integral. The third one is you need to do comparison test. Okay, so I give you 30 minutes. So hopefully you can finish that. Just reserve some time to scan your solution that's sent to me in PDF files over a Moodle. And if you do have any question, uh, you know, run out of time, or whatever, uh, you know, just the last thing, what you can do is you can always send your solution by email and let me know, okay? So it already opened and it will close at midnight today. Okay. And any questions on that quiz? No, you're good? Okay. Um, let me stop sharing that part. Um, I have a question real quick. Yes. Um, so I was looking through the old lecture notes and I noticed that the one for February 17th um, I don't know if it was just me, but every time I tried to open it, it said that it couldn't load for some reason. So I was wondering if you could like repost it or maybe send it to me or something. Oh, uh, I think I can try that. So sure, I can do this. Um, let me see. 17th, I did have that. Maybe the way I print this, if I print this one, let's see. Let me just take a look of um, the files. 17th, yeah, I can open that. Let's see, let me just take a look. Oh, there was an error it says, sorry. Yeah, you're right. But I can just print this out and uh, update that right after class. All right, thank you, let me know. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so we're going to continue to talk about, finish up this section um, 8.1 about the arc length. So what do we did last time? We spent like two days in class. We just did So what do we end up with like uh, the formula if you have like a curve given by a function y equal to f of x and your x goes from a to b. All right, so the, the arc length of the curve is typically we use a letter S is the arc length. In this case, you can do an integration from A to B. Take the square root of one plus F prime of X, square that DX. So this is what do we derived and why we have this weird form right here you take the square root of one plus f prime squared okay so now there might be some other situation that we did two examples right so i'm going to give you another example uh, which is in, in the next page so it's right here so the example is like this one is from the textbook exercises in 8.1 now this time you're given a curve this curve, the description is different. Instead of y equal to f of x, this one is given as x is equal to uh, y to the fourth divided by eight plus one over four y squared, okay? So probably I can, I'm not sure if I can just show you how, how, I, can, how I can graph this. Just give me a second. I just quickly go to Desmos. I want to show you the differences. If I try to solve this problem right now, I got stuck. Because from the formula we have, my y is always equal to a function of x. Here, my x is equal to a function of y. And it's very hard for me to solve y in terms of x. Um, so how will we do that? Let me just type this in first and copy and paste the graph. Um, and I'm typing that on my web browser and uh, just doing one over four times y 
is squared. So I do have the curve right now. Let's just be, uh, move that and copy and paste. Give me a second. Uh, this is not a good one. Uh, zoom that in a little bit. Just a second. All right, back here. So that is the graph I just did over my, you know, decimals. So this is what I have. And actually you see, it's very hard for you to talk about this y equal to um, f of x. In this case, there's no way to do that. Why is that? Can I express this one as y equal to f of x for this function? And I, when we know this is not, not a function. Why? Because it fails the vertical line um, test, right? When you draw a vertical line, it will intersect the curve at the multiple points. So not a function. Um, but what we want to solve in this case is your y is between one and two. So y is between one and two, where's that piece? It's from here. You're looking for the range of y. We're not giving the range of x. So you look at from y because from one, if you can see this, do I need to, do I need to zoom out, uh, zoom in a little bit more? How does that look? Okay. So now here you, oops, okay. My Y goes from one to two. So it goes from here to two. So I'm looking for the arc length of this function. Okay. Now this one, if you only have this guy here, it is a function because it will pass the vertical line test and then we try to solve for this. However, the previous, the formula, what we just talked about in the previous page won't work. So we do need a, another formula to handle this case, okay? So now, so, uh, I want to continue on the first page, uh, like this one here. We need to talk about the uh, next case is, what if you are given a curve like this one, like uh, the vertical curve like this one? Now, this function, what you're given is x is equal to g of y. You see the different descriptions. The first one is y is a function of x. Now, maybe for the second uh, case is x equal to a function of y. That is more convenient uh, for you to describe the curve. And your y goes from c to d. How do we get the arc line? Well, a way to think of that, you can always just go back to the way we did in the last two lectures, right? We use line segment, redo the whole process of deriving the formula. We'll get a similar um, um, one like this. But another quick way to think about that, you see the there's some symmetry between this case and the second case. One way you can think about this is you can rotate your x, y axis 90 degrees, right? You can rotate that. So another way you think about is to me is I'm going to look at how am I going to uh, I'm going to think about I rotated my head another way if I rotated my head 90 degrees. So somehow I'm going to treat uh, this one to be my x axis, the other one is my y y axis. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at this one. If this is my face, um, this is my eyes. So I'm going to look at the curve in this way. Previously, if uh, the one give me, I'm looking the the curve from this direction, right? So now I'm going to look rotate my head. So if I look in this way, so this situation will be very similar to what I had here. So we can get the formula. All I need to do is I just change the row of x and y. So I should have get a similar formula is uh, from c to d. And now you do integration, the square root. Now this time, so your x and the y, they switch roles, right? X, y.
So all you need to do, you take the derivative of y, then square that. Now you do um, that with respect to y. Does that make sense? The way I'm explaining this, right? Okay. So you don't have to repeat the whole process. You just rotate your head and you see basically these two are the same. So with this formula, so we can go back to solve the example in the next page. So we should be able to solve this one here. So all I need to do, I just recognize this is nothing but just a function. So my x is equal to g of y. G of y is just given as y to the fourth over eight plus one over four y squared. And I have variable y between one and two. Figure out the arc length of this one, right? So now all I need to do is follow the procedure. I need to do the solution straightforward application. So you need to do g prime of y first. Uh, just remember g of y is y to the fourth divided by uh, eight. So the derivative, be careful. I, I remember once I gave this problem uh, as a quiz to my, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of mistake the student they made is the little as calculation when they do the derivative, be careful with your calculation, right? So. Especially the second one. The second one is one over four y squared. You take the derivative. So I'm talking about the second term doing the derivative of this. So I would go write that as one quarter y to the minus two, right? This is one over y squared. You take the derivative. So if you take the derivative, a quarter stays the same. The power minus two, bring that down here and the power is decreased by one. So you get a one to minus three. And to simplify this is y cubed over two and the minus a quarter times two minus a half, uh, y to the negative three, right? So y, y to the negative three. I have a question. Yes. Would then, wouldn't that be a negative three instead of negative two? Cause it's the power down to the one less power? <laughs> no. Uh, this okay. one is confusing. This is when you do the integration. When you do integration of that. Oh, I was doing the derivative. Yeah, yeah. You take the new power. When you do the derivative, you still use the original power. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Right. Okay. So um, back here. So y, y to the negative uh, three, you, you can write that as one over y cubed, right? So basically like this. So now, um, if you want, you can, you see a common factor half. So y cubed minus one over y cubed. This is your g prime of y. The reason I do that, because the arc length, I still use s to denote the arc length. Lower bound, upper bound will be the range of y in this case, from one to two, right? So you just need to do the square root of one plus g prime of y squared dy. As in that, that's the reason I want to do this. So you plug in what we just did, a half of y cubed minus one over y cubed. The whole thing, square that. And I remember this as a quiz problem is, was really tricky for my past students. Um, so I'm gonna ask you guys this, how should we handle that? Okay, how can we do the integration of this? Some of them, I think in the past, they just gave up. They said, it's too complicated. They get the most of the points instead of just get the, uh, the full credit. Like this case here, you know, some of them, they knew how to do that. It's uh, just, you just foil this out, carry out, because it says square the thing in that, that bracket, square that. Okay, just be careful when you square this, okay? So it's going to be a mess, but it turns out it's, it will be a very nice thing. So one stays here. So how will you square a half? Don't forget, you always need to square a half, right? So you need to get a quarter. This somehow was a, such a common mistake in the past. A student just forgot about you got to square everything inside that bracket. So a half square, you get a quarter. Now you just need to square this y cubed minus one over y cubed, right? And oops, dy. 
That's the first step. Now the second step, foil this out or just square this out. And you know, we know how to do that, a minus b squared, right? Use the formula. This is never going to be equal to a squared minus b squared. I don't know why. Such a common mistake. Never ever do that. This is also not equal to a squared plus b squared, not that. This, the right away is a squared minus 2ab. I don't think it's such an easy pre-calculus formula. A lot of students, they tend to miss that. a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So this is your a, that is your b. So you look at a squared, y to the 6, minus 2ab and plus b squared. You just carry this out. It's nothing really hard, okay? So you square this. Now what's the next step? You just don't give up. You just uh, just reduce this, simplify this. You have a quarter, y to the six. The nice thing happened, you have y cubed canceled with that y cubed at the bottom. You just have like a number two plus one over uh, y to the six. What should we do with this? Well, let's just uh, add a one to that. So you just add, so you just distribute this one. You have a quarter y to the six and the quarter times two is minus a half and plus a quarter one over y to the six power. Seems like we're going nowhere, okay? So now, well, at least we have one minus a half. You can just add a half because one minus a half, you get a positive a half. Now the next step, but probably that's the key, okay? After all these tedious calculations, we end up with this. In, in the past, some of the students, they said, okay, how can I use like a trick substitution? But no, it's not that hard. So the thing is based on, you know, you have to observe this thing. You pull out the quarter, then what's left underneath that square root? So the first one will be y to the sixth power. What's the second term? You'll put the two here. And the last one will be one over y to the sixth dy. And the, so it turns out this is a perfect square. Why is that? Because this term y to the six plus two plus one, one over y to the six looks very similar to this term you see here. And how do I get this one? This is like the expansion of y cubed minus one over y cubed. So if you realize this two is actually means y to the cubed times one over y cubed. If you have done a lot of problem like in the pre-characters, you realize this one here. So this guy can be written as a perfect square. And that's the hard part. So what you have here is a quarter times y cubed plus one over y cubed square. Take the square root dy. Okay. Now you just have a perfect square. Well, I forgot to write down the integration bounds one, two, one, two, one, two. So with this uh, perfect square, you take the square root. What do I have? Take the square root of a quarter, you have a half. Take the square root of this square, so you have this thing. So this problem was kind of challenging first. A lot of mistakes occurs when the student did the derivatives right here. Another thing is how should we handle once you plug in the formula, how do we deal with this? You have to FOIL this out. And when you FOIL this out, after all this combined, uh, just connecting like terms, if you end up with this, how should we proceed? If you pull this out, you have to be able to recognize this is just a perfect square. So you got this one here, right? Now, once you have this, the, the antiderivative is not that hard because if you pull out the two, so this one just y cubed plus y to the minus third power. And the derivative of this one is just like a quarter y to the fourth. This one here, the new power is the minus two, so minus a half y to the negative two. And the derivative, you'll get that. And then evaluate this. 
put that in. Now I'm going to skip the last step, just plug in the numbers, right? So you will be, you will be done here. So. Or may, maybe just just write one more step. Plug in two. So two to the fourth, that's 16. 16 divided by four, that's four. Minus a half. Uh, plug in four, that's a quarter. This one term. Now plug in one, you have a quarter minus a half. So basically you do the subtraction of this. So you have like a four minus one eighth minus this is like the half a quarter does plus a quarter so this is what you end up with right so now i can finish this. this is a really good example and now it will explain why the book pick up this form because this is an artificially made problem uh, you can get a perfect square of that any questions about this problem? Uh, we want to learn from this one, not the just the details about how to do the pre-calculus pre stuff. I think the most important thing is we know how to handle the situation. When you are given a curve, like a vertical, it's more convenient for you to describe the curve using x equal to g of y. You have a similar formula to find the arc length. Okay. All right, um, any questions? Not an easy one, you know, I, you know, actually I can tell you that year when I had given, uh, when I gave this problem as like a quiz or exam problem, I kind of regret, I did, just didn't expect, you know, there's a lot of steps there. I thought for us, it's kind of not that hard, straightforward, but actually a lot of things. And that's why you need to practice problem. Okay. So. Now, what else do we want to talk about? And actually, there's one more thing is in this case, it doesn't matter uh, dx or dy, which case. To me, there's a different way to understand or to memorize um, the formula. I want to share this with you. This is how I, you know, uh, to think about this one here. So a way. So the third one is I want to summarize all the stuff we did is the formula. Okay. so. Um, to summarize this, so you have the situation, you have a curve C. Well, it doesn't matter Y equal to F of X or X equal to G of Y. In that case, you are Y is between C and the D. And in that case, it's X between A and the B. Okay. So I'm going to look at this. So if this is your curve, so the way to figure out the arc length is you cut that as a lot of pieces, right? This curve, like this one here, the actual curve, this little piece, the actual change people will call delta S. So the delta S will be the exact arc length. So this one will be delta S1, the first change, the second piece delta S sub two, blah, 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 blah. And this one is in the middle delta S sub I. And the last one will be delta S N. The idea to figure out the arc length is you cut that into a lot of small pieces. You find out the arc length of each curve, you sum them up. So I would remember this one as the total arc length will be just the summation of all of these little pieces, steel arcs, okay? So N delta SI, does that make sense? Okay. Now this one, if you send your N to infinity, okay, this looks like a Riemann sum. So there's a very simple formula of, about this one. Okay, so this one is, can be written as integration Delta change to D. This I go away, the S. So what will be the function there? There's no function, actually the function that is one. So there's a very easy formula for me to understand. How do I get the total length, the arc length? It's simply you do the integration of this one DS. That's it. Yeah. Looks like 
this one doesn't make much sense, but it actually the fundamental, this is really deep understanding of that. Okay, you go, why this is one? Because we just add up all those little deltas and the deltas will be the ds. You probably will ask, what does this ds mean? ds is the approximation of one of the piece delta s. So I don't go with this uh, actual curve, I go straight line, right? This is what we did. So the straight line in red will be the differential s. Okay, now how do I calculate this ds? We did that, when, once you have the straight line, you, you can draw a right triangle, go vertically, go horizontal, right? So this one, the horizontal change will be just dx, differential x, and the vertical change will be dy. So we have like a simple Pythagorean theorem, ds equal to ds dx squared plus dy squared. So once you realize, rec, uh, you have this diagram in your mind, so I can go one step further to continue to write, this one just equal to integration of dx squared plus dy squared. And I think, I think this will explain why you have this square root of the square things. This is really important. When we go to chapter 10, we're going to use this formula again. Now you probably want to ask, how does this relate to the formula we did, like, right? So you have two cases, okay? The first the case, when you have y equal to f of x, we can calculate dy. dy is simply d f prime of x dx, right? So that's the first case. So now I can, I can get my dx squared plus my dy squared. In this case, replacing dy by f prime of x squared dx squared. And you pull out the common factor, you have one plus f prime x squared. That's what you have. Then if you take the square root, so you take the square root of all this thing, you end up with one plus f prime of x squared. You work with dx. So that formula converts to this case. What about the second case? You have x is equal to GY. In this case, now you're doing DX. Now you have G prime of Y DY. Once again, this square Pythagorean theorem thing, DX squared plus DY squared now becomes G prime of Y squared DY squared. The second DY squared stays the same. You do the derivative. Once uh, you, you take the square root, you pull out the dy like what we did, it gives you one plus g prime of y squared dy. So in this two cases, so this one simple formula just covers two cases. Okay. Depends on your description. So in chapter 10, in chapter 10, you have different kind of descriptions of curve. Somehow you have parametric equation or you have an equation in polar curve, in polar coordinates. How do we find out arc length? We're going to still going to use this formula right here. And it's just your dx, dy, the differentials, the different, but you're still going to use this. So that's why I think this one is really important. And, the to, and the, to me is really intuitive. You want to find the total line arc length, you just sum up of a little piece that's why you have integration for one ds. This guy ds, you can use this diagram, Pythagorean theorem to get this. And people will call this ds term, that's the differential of the arc length function. Any questions about that? You can read this in the second part of section 8.1. There's actually a lot of understanding into that. If you just purely memorize this, you probably won't ask. That's I, a couple of students in the past, they asked what the heck the book was talking about this because this is a uniform formula, okay? This is the key for the differential calculus. That's in my opinion, okay? Uh, one more question. If you read the book, it says, why do I use so-called arc length function? People say arc length is just a number. 
how come it becomes a, a function? Well, maybe the previous example can serve as a way to explain this, right? So like this one, what I did is I find the arc length y goes from one to two, right? Okay. And I can modify this problem a little bit. What does that mean? Oh, instead of asking you find arc length y goes from one to two, I can ask you the case. How about I do y is between one to 2.5? In that case, you're going to extend this curve a little bit because your y goes to 2.5. You're going to try to go all the way there, right? So when you change the upper bound, you, even if you don't change the lower bound, as the upper bound changes, the arc length change. I can also change that to find the arc length from y between one to 1.5. In that case, you just go from one to 1.5. You just figure out the part of the arc length right there. So in general, what we can do is we can, we can fix the lower bound and the, get the upper bound. Okay, so as a variable. So uh, this one I want to talk about, okay. function, how do we understand this? I just use the case y is equal to f of x, right? Now x between a, now the upper bound is t. t is a variable. t can be greater than or equal to a or less than or equal to a. Now this case, I'm going to find the arc length function. It depends on the upper bound. Okay, so we know the arc length, so it's always like from a to t, whatever you have, because that's just the upper bound. You do f prime of x square dx, right? So that's why as t changes, so s is a function of t. You can work out the general function and plug in t to get the different length, right? So now, uh, once we have this thing here, and we, uh, how do we do the derivative? It turns out we can do the derivative of s with respect to t. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, okay, part one. You do the, basically you are doing the derivative of the integral. So here I'm going to ask you guys a trivia question. You may have learned that in, pre, uh, in calculus one. What's the result I get? You do the, take a function, you do the integration, then you do differentiation. What do you get? Just a function, right? Yeah, it's a function. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So it's all of these things, uh, the fancy main fundamental theorem of calculus, I think I did a review in this case. It's really simple. You think about the family tree, right? You take a function, so that's the current generation that may be you. You do integration, so you do antiderivative. You go to your parent, right? You go this one. Now you do the derivative. Derivative means the kids, the offspring, so you go back. So you do, end, you do integration, go back, you do derivative, goes down. So that means you go back to your generation. It's kind of this, how I understand that. So you just get this, whatever function you back. So, but you have to replace that by T. So this is what you have. So that's it, a square root. So uh, somehow this one is the same as if you multiply both S by T. So you end up with, this form. Why do I talk about this form? This is similar to what I did right there. See, I just replaced a t by x. So this explains why this is called the differential of the arc length. Okay. All right, uh, you don't have to you know, read the book, then this thing will make sense. We're going to come back to that. Uh, so, uh, do I need to do one example about this? Yeah, let's do um, just one one example about this. Okay. So, otherwise, all this arc length function won't make sense. Okay. So this is the case. Do I have a problem from the textbook or maybe, yeah, let's just do this as well. So here's an example. So it says find the arc length function for the curve 
y equal to 2 to the x raised to the 3 halves power with the starting point. Starting point when uh, p0. p0 has coordinates 1. When x is equal to 1, what is the y? So you plug in 1 for x. So 2 right there. So this is what this problem is about, the arc length function. So I guess uh, maybe I think use Desmos to show that. So now, uh, sorry about that. I'm going to jump to uh, another screen. So stop me sharing this here. Screen two with you guys. Are you seeing my web browser says Desmos? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, this is what I just did. So I'm going to change that, click that list. So I'm going to type in y equal to two times uh, x raised to the three halves, three halves power. So that will be the curve. Okay. So this, this is the curve we're talking about. Where's the starting point? So starting point is at the one comma two. You see the, the green dot right there? So your curve starting from there. It does not ask you about which part of the, the arc. So you can go from x goes to two, you can go there or different places. So that means your x coordinate won't, um, it's not given there, right? Okay. So, um, hold on a second. So let me just do the, solve this problem. So what we do is, is we do for any t, a real number t. So I'm going to do the arc length function, the problem says, because it's not, you're not given the upper bound, okay? So uh, the starting point is one, so you always do the integration from, just so keep that in your mind. Still, you're still on Desmos, is that where you want to be? Or oh, oh, yes, no, sorry, thank you. Uh -huh. um, what's the best way, can I, if I move this one, are you seeing my one oh, yeah, note? You can go back and forth. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let me just uh, stop sharing that one. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So sorry, I forgot that. So I just pick a T. Just remember, you had, if you are T, so X is between one and the T. X can be between one and the T when T is greater than one, right? Or X is between T and the one when T is to the left of one. But whatever that is, you just do integration from the lower bound, maybe the lower bound to T. Now here you just plug in one plus whatever F prime of X in this case, squared DX, right? Squared DX. And in this case, what is my F? That's no F, but you interpret this. This is your F of X. So you're doing F of X is equal to two to the X to the three halves. Easy calculation, F prime of X will be three X to the one half power. If you square that and take the square root, you have one plus square this thing. You can be careful, you have nine x to the first power because three x to the half, you square that. That gives you this, one plus nine x. So now uh, we end up with this thing, integration from one to t, square root one plus nine t dt. It's a very easy substitution. I'm gonna skip the steps, just give you the antiderivative is one ninth, two thirds times one plus nine t three halves power, we evaluate now. This is X. Somehow this is wrong. This is X, this is X. You plug in one, the T, uh, you end up with this as two over 27. Uh, you have one plus 90, three halves power minus 10 to the three has power. This is the your arc length function. Depends on what t it is. Okay. Now, what's good thing about this t is, is just, if people ask you on uh, the arc length for axes between one and uh, three, 
How will you do that? So you just recognize in this case, your T is equal to three. So all you need to do is you just evaluate S of three, plug that into the formula and you are done, right? Times three, then blah, 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 this thing. And if they change that to a different arc line, say X is between one and 10. So all you need to do is you do S of 10, right? So that's the one of the, the advantage why you have this arc line. What I'm going to ask you is, uh, what happens when S is at one? So when S is the one, when you plug that in, you get zero. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes sense because you just start at one, two, you stop at one or two, there's no, you just have a single point. So the arc length is equal to zero, that makes sense. And what if, can I do S of zero? So when S of zero, you plug in zero for T right here, you have one, you have one minus 10 to the three halves. So why is less than this? You have an arc length is less than zero. How can that possible? This is a question I'm going to ask you. If, if you have done um, calculation, you find out the arc length is zero. Does that make sense? You have arc length is the negative number. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, how do you make a story of that? But nothing wrong, right? With my calculation, I just get a negative numbers. This formula is correct. You want to find out the length between zero and the one, I just plug in zero, I get a negative. I mean, point. could you get like a, I mean, it's negative right now, but it's part of because the bounds are from one to zero. But yeah, that's, yeah, if that's the thing. The bounds, can, go ahead. Yeah, if you were to like flip the bounds instead of from one to zero, from zero to one, then it'd always be a positive number now, right? Yeah, that's the mathematical part. So in real life situation, how will I make like a good, like explain that in words? Why do I have a negative arc length? I think mathematically, the way to explain that people make up a story that if you, they call you have an orientation of the curve. So you start, I'm showing you the screen, right? Uh, of Desmos. If you start with this green dot, when your T is greater than one, that means you are traveling uh, to the right. So you, you follow this curve. So it's kind of like curve to your left. When you have like the T goes to zero, that means you are traveling backwards. So mathematically in differential geometry or some other place, uh, you know, they try to define the orientation of a curve. Is somehow, if you start with this, you travel this direction, you get a positive orientation. If you travel backwards, you have just like, a, you know, opposite orientation. That's why the sign minus tells you the difference. It's kind of like when you throw a ball right here, you throw it up. It depends on how you define what is a plus of five feet up or a negative. If you can define plus, it means going up, or you can define plus goes downward. So it's just like a sign showing you the direction. Okay. So this is something, a follow up, a few follow up questions after you have done this um, arc length function. Okay. All right. Uh, I think finally, this is all you need to know for this one short section, 8.1. I just, I always want to spend more time on the first section because it shows how to derive things and a lot of deep understanding of the arc length and the differential of the arc length. Okay. Right, any questions? Uh, I have a five minutes. I just want to also start on uh, section 8.2. Once we know how to do the arc lengths, 8.2 will make it easy for us, I think, kind of. So now what we want to do is uh, next one. So we want to talk about the surface area of solids generated by uh, rotation on. Uh, so 
or somehow people call that revolutions. Okay. Uh, in this case, you know, we only talk about the simple case, like uh, you have like a two D curve. At the other, I explained that. Uh, so you have a curve like this. This is your curve, y equal to f of x, a two dimensional curve. So you want to form a solid. So you can do rotation. WRT stands for with respect to uh, the y axis. So uh, typically, when you, uh, I draw this thing, is I get the image because I'm doing the rotation with respect to x axis. Uh, somehow I draw something like that. Okay. So it means you rotate that with respect to y axis. So all I need to do is get the image of this curve with respect to y. Think about you put an, a, a mirror along the y axis. So the image, so this point will be A goes to negative A there. So that's the image of that point. And this point kind of goes to minus B. So sort of, all I get is get the image of the curve that colored in green. Then rotate, rotate something where you look from the top, right? The top surface will be a circle. So I'm just going to just draw kind of like a circle. That's what you see on top. And also in the bottom, if you look from the top, okay, so this is at, this is the sodium. And uh, in between that, you just have a lot of, like you take one cross section, it will be similar to that. So you just kind of like get a bow shape of things, right? Okay, so this is a solid. So we want to see, um, how do we find uh, the surface area? Okay. So I'm not good at drawing these things, or then maybe some people can draw that with like three dimensional point of view, it's just by using uh, X and the Y, Z. But because we have the rotation, this will serve the, the purpose, okay? We don't have to draw that case. Okay. Now, the second thing is we can also do the uh, revolution or the rotation with respect to the y-axis. Oh, sorry, the x-axis. So I'm going to still use the a similar curve, generate a solid. So if this is the curve, very similar to what I just did, y could f of x. Now this time you rotate with respect to y -ax, uh, the x-axis, you can get this way. So uh, I will draw the, Draw the solid in, in, in a similar way, get the image of that point. This time the mirror is on the x axis, is right there. At that point, it goes down here. So the image now is going to be colored in purple. And now, now you look from the positive direction of x axis from the right. So the bottom one, what you see, the cross section, the base will be like a circle, a disc, right? And the top one, if you look from the negative direction of x-axis, you also see a disc. So you also have like a bow shape of a thing if you rotate your head, all right? So we want to figure out the surface area. That's what we want to deal with. We're not going to deal with uh, the case why people say, why do you always rotate with x or y axis, right? You can also take this one here. You can rotate with respect to this horizontal line and you still I think the way to do that is just get the image and you can get that, find a surface area. The most complicated case is the applied project after this section is you don't have to always do rotate a line parallel to the X or Y axis. How about I just draw any uh, slant line? How do I find the, the solid generated by this? Well, similar way you go get the image of this one then you just have like a, the image. This is the surface you're going to get, find the surface area. So that's the thing we want to deal with. This is more complicated. We're, we're, we're going to skip that, but we're going to do all that um, next Monday. Now in, we're going to, I'm going to go a little bit faster to derive the formula. Uh, finish, try to finish, finish this one next Monday. Okay. I think that's all for today. Do you have any questions? 
All right, so you have a quiz due tonight. So other than that, uh, homework due next Monday. So um, have a good one. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah.